You ready? All right, here we go. Our first speaker comes from CrowdStrike. And I've been told I can't tell you the title that I was using before, uh, so I'm going to uh, supplement a question mark. So how the question mark hacked the DNC. Can I say that? <laughs> um, uh, Michael Graven, the director of services for CrowdStrike, has a very long history in security space. He currently oversees a large world-class services organization that specializes in the pro, po, pre and post incident response. Prior to joining CrowdStrike, Michael was the director at uh, Mandiant. Today he's here to discuss the recent and much publicized hack of the of a entity who shall remain nameless is that is that better <laughs> um, he can give some insight on on how his team was able to catch and thwart off the adversaries uh, that came from an entity that I can't say uh, and the actors that were involved <laughs> so now if you're totally curious please welcome to the stage Michael Graven Thanks. Um, so, just to to level set, um, we the title of the of the talk in the program is how Russia hacked the DNC. It is actually one of the interesting questions um, in any incident. One of the questions that comes up from our clients when we're handling uh, handling an incident response is, "Who did this? Who did this to us? How did it happen?" Um, those are two interesting questions, sometimes more interesting than others. And in this particular case, what I'd like to um, tell you about today is two threat actor groups in particular that we've been tracking for a while, which we believe these groups are associated with the activity um, breaking into the Democratic National Committee earlier this year. Uh, a quick show of hands, who had heard of CrowdStrike prior to this event? Are marketing people doing their job? They are, excellent. Um, how many of you all were aware that we had worked on this DNC event? Some, okay. Um, so the, um, the backstory here is, is told in a Washington Post article by Ellen Nakashima. Um, the DNC was advised and partially discovered that they had some threat actors in their environment and uh, in, in order to investigate that, they gave us a ring and our services organization mobilized to help them do it. What I'd like to tell you about today is um, a little bit of information about CrowdStrike itself, the approach that we took to investigating incidents like this one. I won't be speaking specifically about this incident because all the things that we can say about this incident have already been said publicly. Um, but I'll, I'll be telling you about our approach to incidents like this and then some information about the threat actors that we've identified as responsible for this activity. Now why is this interesting? Uh, why is it interesting in California, something that happened in DC a couple months ago that's related to the national election and doesn't necessarily have anything to do with, with state operations? Well, the tie here is that these threat actors um, have compromised not just the entities that are in the news today, but their actions go back a very long way. Um, their actions are all associated with and aligned with the interests of a nation state, which we believe to be Russia. Um, and when you see these threat, when you see evidence of these threat tactics in an environment, that tells you that your, uh, your adversary has an interest in you, and it helps you understand what you can do to better defend your interests against their interests. So with that, let's go on a bear hunt. My last uh, question, how many people here have kids? We're gonna catch a big one. Love that story, my kid is eight. Um, so if we could have the next slide, or do I have the next slide here? Looks like I have it here, look at that. Um, so some background on CrowdStrike services and our intelligence operation. Um, how many folks are familiar with the notion of a TTP? 
Is that an acronym that, you know, I can tell everybody who used to work in the military? Uh, that's a tactic, technique, or procedure. Um, a TTP is something that a threat actor does. It's not necessarily a piece of malware that he uses, uh, but it may be the way that he operates in an environment, uh, things, things that he does that you can find him by. We're going to talk about the TTPs of two Russian threat actors, and then I'll take you through some of the items that we look at in order to conduct a successful incident response. So in our CrowdStrike services operation, we have two major areas that we work in. Number one, we help uh, organizations conduct and execute for them in incident response. Number two, we help them conduct proactive uh, engagements beforehand. So before you have an incident, what are the things that you can do? We help organizations figure out how, where are they today, where should they get to in the future, and how can they get from here to there. Um, this is all in the context of identifying the adversaries that are, that are relevant to a target and helping them prioritize their defenses against those adversaries. If you have lots of money, in, under your control, perhaps you're a financial institution or you have lots of PII because you have information about, uh, about humans, uh, it makes sense to defend against those people who steal money and steal PII respectively. Those are the sorts of things that we work with. And the methodology that we use is to combine intelligence information about the adversary together with technical and business information about the potential target in order to figure out who's in the environment, what assets do they have control of, what information have they accessed, changed, or perhaps already stolen, and then eject those folks from the environment quickly. Uh, speed, is one of the, speed is one of the things that we focus on because the less time a threat actor is active in your environment, uh, the lower your risk is to continued operations. So a couple months back, uh, there were some news stories in the Washington Post and the Times here identifying that a couple of Russian government hackers, was the phrase that the Post used, got into the Democratic National Committee and stole some information. Um, the Putin story to the right there is a little more recent. That's from just a few days ago. And is analysis from the same paper as to why the Russian government, and in particular the man in charge of it, may be interested in conducting these operations which up until this year, don't, don't kid yourselves, this kind of stuff happens all the time. Um, up until recently though, it didn't become public knowledge and a lot of the folks, a lot of the organizations that were conducting offensive operations tried very hard to stay under the, under the radar. Um, so we'll talk about a few of those, uh, a few of those engage, uh, a few of those, those threat actor groups. Um, again, today we're focused mostly on the Russians, but CrowdStrike Intelligence, which is a, probably about a 50 person organization within our, within our company, tracks threat, act threat actors that are in access to Russia, China, Iran, uh, North Korea, Syria, uh, some transnational ones, uh, plenty, of, plenty of Chinese threat actors. There's, I think we're up to almost 50 or 60 of them. Um, today we'll just focus on two of them. So there, there are two that we have given the names Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear. Uh, other companies use different names for them. What, oh, the guy riding the bear? Yeah. Um, all, we name all of our Russian threat actors uh, something or another bear. All of our Chinese threat actors are something panda. Um, and uh, the Iranian, so here's a question for you. The Iranian threat actors we call something kitten. Anybody know why? Persian, yeah, Persian cat. Also, you know, it's a little disrespectful and I'm okay with that. The, um, so the two threat actors that we'll talk about here are Cozy Bear, um, which is also called Cozy Car and Cozy Duke. They have been in the past, this threat group has been linked to the intrusions at the White House, the State Department, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Now, their operations appear to be very well aligned with the tasking priorities of the Russian FSB. Uh, the FSB is a Russian intelligence agency that combines kind of some of the stuff that our FBI does and some of the stuff that our NSA does. So signals intelligence, monitoring, um, trying to get information about other, other countries, and then also has an internal security function the way the FBI does for us. Uh, the second group, Fancy Bear, uh, so named because uh, their, their malware is, uh, can be pronounced sophacy, and uh, that, that song, I'm, I'm So Fancy, was playing on the radio when our malware analyst was working on it, and so <laughs> that was that. Um, the Fancy Bear group has been linked to intrusions against other, company, or other countries, uh, German and French media in particular, TV, uh, TV Saint-Monde, 
and um, the German one I don't recall. Uh, they have links that appear um, more aligned with the Russian GRU. Uh, the GRU is another Russian intelligence agency, but their focus is more like our defense intel DIA, uh, where they're focused more on protecting internal. But um, one of the interesting things about the Russian intel scene is that even their internal agencies have a very external focus. They're, they're more aggressive about going and collecting externally to achieve internal ends than uh, Western agencies tend to be. Uh, there's a third agency, the old KGB, which is now called the SVR, which is like our CIA. Uh, we haven't nexus these two groups to them just yet, but you never know. So I mentioned earlier TTPs, um, tactics, techniques, and procedures. And the first one that's interesting about both of these groups is they both tend to use tools that are in the, client, or in the target's environment, but tools that are not necessarily malware. Many of these groups use malware as a means to an end, but the more sophisticated threat groups get off the malware train as soon as they can and start using programs that are legitimate with legitimate internal user credentials. Because if you think about it for a second, what's the holy grail of working inside an environment? It's getting access to things as an insider um, because that becomes much, much more difficult to track unless you have some help on your side. And that's one of the things that we do. So some of the tools that we've seen these groups using are, for example, PowerShell and the Windows management infrastructure. WMI is used in large environments to manage endpoints. To, and, and oftentimes, you'll find WMI tools and accounts that have read and write privileges. Um, side question. It, think, think like an attacker for a moment. My colleague Chuck is going to demonstrate some attacks a little bit later in the afternoon. So, so think like an attacker. Think like Chuck. If you were a, uh, if you had your choice of any authentication credentials that you could steal in an environment, what would be the most awesome one to have in your hands? Domain administrator, always the first answer. What was that? Read. Root. Root. Yep. Yeah. Domain domain admin. Root. Something like that. There's another one that's really good. The ticket? Oh, 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 golden ticket, nice. Um, I wasn't going to talk about that today, but, uh, but we can on, in, on a sidebar. The most awesome credential to have in an environment is the backup credential, because he can read everything, right? Net backup or, or semantic backup or something like that. Um, and it's not unusual at all to see that backup pseudo account accessing data across the whole, the whole estate. Um, so trying to find attackers who are using that kind of level of access and tools that are legitimate and not malware is a difficult, difficult thing, and that's intentional. These folks, they, they do use malware at some point in the attack cycle, but they try to get off it as quickly as they can. So the key becomes looking at the use of these legitimate tools looking at those patterns of use to try to identify um, and sort out the difference between, well, these kind of look like system administrator things, and these kind of look like attacker things. Uh, that's tricky, and it's fun, and it's a, it's a big part of trying to find an advanced threat actor like this. The second tactic that's interesting about these groups is how they farm access into, um, or how they manage their access into an environment. Uh, Cozy and Fancy differ a little bit here. They, they both use uh, implants, uh, software, malware, those, those terms are somewhat interchangeable, um, that are modular and they can load capabilities in and out of the software that's under their control. So if they don't need, for example, um, credential stealing uh, software at, the, at a particular point in their environment, they don't have to leave their tools lying around. They can just load them in when they need them, run them, and then pull them back out. Uh, where we see some differences, though, uh, between the routine maintenance, both of these groups will uh, get access into the environment and then periodically come back and start swapping things out, right? Swap out the old for the new, change their command and control destinations. They use encrypted communications. Uh, the cozy group tends to use more encryption than the fancy group. The fancy group tends to um, use HTTPS, but they also do direct IP address connections as well. Um, one of the things that is troubling about the Fancy Bear group is that, like a, like a number of threat actors, they try to get external VPN access to an environment. So if they can steal sufficient credentials that they can just VPN in as a user using stolen credentials, um, that can be very difficult for a lot of organizations to track because most folks looking at VPN logs will figure, well, you know, you had to get, you had to have credentials to get in here. 
Now the third tactic uh, for both of these groups is something called WMI persistence. This goes super nerd, super fast. Um, consider only this. There are lots of ways to get software running uh, every time you log into a system. Um, there are also lots of tools to inspect that list of stuff that runs all the time and uh, tries to find the sort the evil out from the good. This tactic's relatively advanced. Um, the interesting thing about it is it's quite hard to find and you haven't seen it in a lot of engagements so far. So, uh, you know, plus, plus one point for the bears on this one, plus two points for us, we found it. And the way we found it was to use three different technologies. We use our Falcon technologies. Uh, any incident response team really should have these three types of capabilities, whether they're ours or somebody else's. Falcon Host is an endpoint activity tool that we use. It monitors and protects endpoints from things that are happening right now. It knows how to, find, it knows how to see evil things that are happening in real time and uh, stop them in real time and report on them in real time. The second thing that we use is called Falcon Forensics. This is a retroactive tool, so think a rear view mirror of your car. What happened in the past, can we collect artifacts from the endpoint or endpoints across the environment to reveal actions that may have been happening when real-time monitoring was not running. And then the third thing is uh, network traffic inspection. We have a stack called the Falcon Network. Uh, this is packet capture and analysis looking for threat actor, uh, signs of threat actor tactics. Uh, with these three pieces of visibility at scale, we can rapidly answer questions like, which systems in this environment are under an attacker's control? How is he doing it? Can we do this on a scale of 100 machines? Yeah, that's, that's orange juice before breakfast. Can we do it on a scale of 100,000 machines? Now we're talking interesting sizes. Uh, because across a population of 100,000 machines, we can start applying a lot of the machine learning that works in, in our platform and in some of our analysis tools in order to um, really identify what are the, what's the evil that's happening in the environment. Um, when doing analysis at scale, you're answering the questions about who are the threat actors, or what are the threat actors in my environment doing, and how soon can I get them out of here? The answer to how soon you can get them out of your environment is as soon as you know the full scope of what they're doing. And that's what we do. So, since we have a 15 minute slot today, I can't tell you exactly how we do it, but I hope you'll take away two things about, the, uh, about what we've talked about today. Number one, um, no matter, who you, uh, no matter who you support in the election, we have external forces today that are trying to influence the American political process, and that needs to stop. Uh, we all have a responsibility to find that and stop it. Number two, we've identified some threat actors here that we think have uh, nation state attribution to them, and I'd personally like to see a lot more international pressure applied to those folks. Thanks for your time. Talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.